Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to be Shakespearean rather than Franklinian, you know, for the rain, it raineth every day. You know that line? Um, so my name is Bob Hauser. I serve as executive officer of the American Philosophical Society, uh, and I welcome everybody here to this annual celebration of the life and the enduring contributions of Benjamin Franklin. Um, this event is organized each year in Philadelphia by the Franklin Celebration Committee, composed of volunteers from organizations affiliated with Franklin and other interested individuals. And I think for the, for the record, why don't we have the folks who are on the committee stand up for, to, and be recognized uh, for. If the, especially for those of you who came in late, but for everybody actually, there are several items related to Franklin that are on display on either side of the stage here, and I, I uh, uh, encourage you to see them later on. Um, first of all, over there, we have uh, Benjamin Franklin's will and testament uh, from the Franklin Institute, uh, and in his will, he, uh, Franklin freed his slaves. Uh, and then from the Library of the American Philosophical Society, we have an address to the public from the Pennsylvania Society for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery, which is dated uh, 1789, and was published by Franklin, who was then the president of that society. He had been elected to the PA, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, in 1787. It's a broadside meant to win support for their cause and to solicit funds for their society. A few months after this broadside was, was printed, uh, Franklin petitioned the U.S. Congress on behalf of the society to put an end to slavery. And that was notably unsuccessful. Um, and, to, and to end the slave trade as well. Uh, and then the other part of this display over here, which is just incredibly striking, is the plan of an African slave ship's lower deck. Uh, with additional remarks on the slave trade, which was published by the Society for, the, for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery in 1789. It's one of the first powerful anti-slavery images, and it includes a description of the conditions on board the ship that were written by Sir William Elward, an English abolitionist. Now, biographer Walter Isaacson has written that Franklin was, during his 84-year-old life, America's best scientist, inventor, diplomat, writer, and business strategist, and he was one of the most practical, though not the most profound, of its political thinkers. As executive officer of the, of the American Philosophical Society, I'm honored and pleased to join the committee in this morning's celebration here in the hall named for the Society's founder. Dr. Franklin, who was watching over us but hidden by the screen there. Um, but I want to offer a brief overview of the APS, which will help to explain the Society's interest in today's events. The Society was founded by Franklin at age 37 in 1743. And for those of you who can do arithmetic very quickly, you will soon realize that this is the 275th year of the Society. In the words of Franklin's proposal for promoting useful knowledge among the British plantations in America, he wrote, the first drudgery of settling new colonies, which confines the attention of people to mere necessaries, is now pretty well over. And there are many in every province and circumstances that set them at ease and afford leisure to cultivate the finer arts and improve the common stock of knowledge. To such of these who are men of speculation, Many hints must from time to time arise. Many observations occur, which if well examined, purified, and improved, might produce discoveries to the advantage of some or all of the British plantations or to the benefit of mankind in general. To put the matter succinctly, Franklin thought it was time to create an American institution corresponding to and in correspondence with the British Royal Society. Philosophy in the name of the American Philosophical Society is not about philosophy in the modern sense of the term, but rather, as it was understood in Franklin's time, about the pursuit of knowledge 
and especially natural philosophy, which we now call science. If you think of philosophy as in doctor philosophy, and I expect there are a number of those around the room here, uh, rather than philosophy as an intellectual pursuit. In fact, I, I will tell you that a few years ago I was told, this was slightly before my time, uh, the membership of the society was distressed to learn that there were no philosophers among the members. Um, so we honor and engage leading scholars, scientists, and professionals through elected membership and opportunities for intellectual interdisciplinary fellowship, particularly in our semi-annual meetings. There are now about 830 elected resident members who represent physical, biological, and social and behavioral sciences, arts and humanities, and public service, plus a much smaller number of international members. We support research and discovery through grants and fellowships, lectures, publications, prizes, exhibitions, and public education. We now award well over 200 grants and fellowships each year. The proceedings of the APS, initiated in 1771, is the oldest continuously published scholarly journal in the United States. And I will add, all of the issues are now available electronically in JSTOR. More than 120,000 visitors toured our 2017 exhibition, which just closed, Curious Revolutionaries Across the Street, which celebrated the lives and accomplishments of Charles Wilson Peale and his many descendants. On January 18th, just next week, here in Franklin Hall, we'll sponsor a public lecture by John Bowles, who has just published a magnificent new biography of another APS president, Thomas Jef Jefferson. We serve scholars through a research library of some 13 million manuscripts and other collections internationally recognized for their enduring historic value and increasingly accessible in digital form. Our main collections are in American history, especially around the era of the American Revolution, the history of science, technology, and medicine, and Native American language and anthropology. And that last one actually dates from a very strong interest of Thomas Jefferson. The American Philosophical Society's current activities reflect Franklin's spirit of inquiry, provide a forum for the free exchange of ideas, and convey our conviction that intellectual inquiry and critical thought are inherently in the best interest of the public. Nothing could be more important at this time of widespread public derogation of knowledge in general and science in particular. The theme of this year's Franklin celebration is race awareness in America. In keeping with that theme, this day is dedicated to the memory of William T. Coleman, Jr., who was inducted as the member of the American Philosophical Society in 2001 and who died last year. Coleman was an exceptionally accomplished lawyer and public servant, an advisor to six presidents, member of President Gerald Ford's cabinet, who played a major role in framing the landmark civil rights suit, Brown versus Board of Education. And our second speaker, Emma Lepsansky, will have more to say about Mr. Coleman. This morning's seminar will be followed by a procession to Dr. Franklin's grave for some brief words of recognition if we are not all bowled over by the wind on the way. And then there will be a luncheon at the Museum of the American Revolution with this year's Franklin Founder Award honoree, Robert Bogle. So, our first speaker this morning is Jean Sunder Soderlund. Each of the three talks will last about 20 minutes and the floor will be open for questions after the third and last talk. Professor Soderlund is Professor Emeritus of History at Lehigh University. She's a historian of 17th and 18th century British America with special interest in questions of ethnicity, gender, religion, and class. Her most recent book, Lenape Country, Delaware, Value, Delaware Valley Society before William Penn, was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. She's also offered, authored Quakers and Slavery, A Divided Spirit, co-authored Freedom by Degrees, Emancipation in Pennsylvania and its Aftermath, and published articles on women and colonial British America. The title of Professor Soderlund's talk is Brothers No More Than Apes and Colonists in the Delaware Valley.
Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. It's great to see everyone. This, we, we don't have an accurate portrait of Lenape in the 17th century, but in 1735, Gustavus Hesselius, a Swedish painter, um, did two portraits of Lenape sachems who lived in the Bucks County Lehigh Valley area. One is Tishkahan, the other is Vapawinsa. Both men and their communities were impacted by the walking purchase, which I'll talk about later. And I think that Pesalius's portraits were both quite accurate uh, and empathetic to the situation that the Lenapes were facing at the time. My goal today is to do a couple of things. One is to talk about the Lenape's expectations and ideals when the, Lenape, uh, when the European immigrants came to the Delaware Valley in the early 17th century. And secondly, to talk briefly about how the uh, situation changed for Lenape's in their interactions with the colonists over the 17th and early 18th century and then to speak briefly about how Benjamin Franklin interacted with the Lenapes as well. I don't think, in, in thinking of the theme for today, race awareness, based on my reading, and albeit there are mostly European sources from this colonial time period, I don't think that Lenapes thought in terms of Europeans being a race until the middle of the 18th century, if then, some did by that point. But most thought more in terms of Dutch, Swedes, Finns, English, and how to deal with them politically and economically. So that it wasn't until the mid 18th century with considerable problems by then that the, some Lenapes at least, started to think in terms of the white man um, and dealing with uh, individuals as part of that larger group of people. Okay, when the Dutch first came to the Delaware Valley in the early 16th century, the plan was to trade and the Lenapes controlled the region from Cape Henlopen in Delaware up through southern New Jersey to about where Trenton is today, the falls of the Delaware, and then in eastern Pennsylvania up to about the Le Lehigh Valley. This was the land of the Lenapes or Unamis, uh, people who were living north of that area were the Munsees, but they were also called the Lenapes. So that there was a larger group of Lenapes with two uh, dialects uh, that were quite similar, but also different. Actually, when the Dutch first came, when the Lenapes talked about themselves, they would say Lenape, which meant us, we the people, like we talk about ourselves, or most of us here probably talk about as ourselves as Americans. But they also identified, and probably more importantly identified, as Kohansis, Naratikans, Armawamis, Mantis. And some of these groups, these towns, controlled land on both sides of the Delaware. So the Delaware wasn't a border, a, a border, a boundary. You didn't have to cross a bridge. You took a canoe to your land in central Delaware if you were Cohansi. The Armawamis uh, lived in the area of Timber Creek in New Jersey, but also lived in the area that's now Philadelphia. This was Armawamis territory in the 17th century. Over the 17th century, the Lenapes declined in population because of European diseases and intermarried with one another. And by the 
early to mid 18th century were often referred to as Delawares, which was an English term. The population of Lenape de declined from about 8,000 in 1600 to 3,000 by 1670 and 2,000 by 1700. But notice they maintained control, and this is key to our understanding of the Lenapes in the colonial period. They maintained control of the Delaware Valley until after William Penn came. Because until 1670, there were only 870 Europeans in the Delaware Valley, as opposed to 3,000 Lenapes. The Europeans who were here, the Swedes and Finns, knew that the uh, Lenapes controlled the area, and they refrained from bringing in more people uh, because they knew that there would be trouble, and I want to explain that in a minute uh, regarding the forcefulness of the Lenapes. But equally important is the fact that the Lenapes brought, or didn't bring, they were here already, they held important principles that we generally think as principles that William Penn brought. Principles of uh, conflict re resolution through peace, of belief in freedom for everyone, a reciprocal freedom where it's not just you who should be free, but everyone else. Uh, whereas slaveholders certainly thought they should be free, but you know, people who were working for them should be enslaved. To the Lenapes, freedom was very important. They did not enslave other people, and they uh, practiced this idea of reciprocal liberty. They also maintained their sovereignty. The Lenapes, until the mid uh, 18th century, and even for many after that, did not subject themselves to any government, either the English, the colonial government, or any, or the Dutch or the Swede. They maintained their separation. Now, while I say that the Lenapes placed a premium on peace, in fact, they did use violence when necessary to protect their communities. When they saw a problem arising, they would use violence. And so they weren't pacifists. An example, came in uh, 1631, when the Dutch changed their policy from trade to deciding to set up plantation colonies. The first was at, oops, was at Swanendale, uh, sorry about this, at Cape Henlopen. What the Lenapes saw with this uh, colony, small colony, 32 men, uh, built walls. They were whaling as well as raising corn and uh, tobacco. But what the Lenapes saw was the first step towards establishing a colony like Virginia or New England. They certainly knew about Virginia and the mayhem there. And so once the Dutch settlers at Swanendale ran out of gifts in order to practice reciprocity, um, and because of other problems, they murdered uh, or killed um, all of the colonists there. And what they did was establish a principle that there would be no plantation colonies in the Delaware Valley, that they would maintain control. They were happy to establish, to have the Europeans establish uh, forts for trading, uh, small, very small plantations or farms uh, for supporting themselves. Uh, they were happy to have the Swedes, the Finns, and the English under the Duke of York uh, to, as long as they were peaceful, you know, to live near them and to trade. But 
they were not uh, going to put up with a plantation colony there. And that's why by 1670, there were only 850 Europeans in the Delaware Valley. Nevertheless, what we have by the 1680s is William Penn's purchase of the, Del uh, of the West Bank of the Delaware Valley. He also owned a lot of property in West Jersey as well. But as we know, his main colony was Pennsylvania. And with that colony, he brought thousands of colonists. This changed the terms for the Lenapes. They certainly um, would have welcomed Quakers, and they did welcome the Quakers and the other colonists, until it became clear that the settlement was going to be as dense as with the uh, colonies in Jamestown, Virginia, and uh, New England. And so once that became clear, uh, there was trouble brewing. Um, and we can see exactly what the uh, plans were of Penn. We know what his plans were to uh, settle densely, to bring in the colonists, to sell the land, to make Pennsylvania a financially uh, profitable uh, colony, as well as to provide religious freedom uh, for the, the Quakers. So there were a lot of principles that were common between the Quakers and William Penn and the Lenapes. And so they, they got along quite well, uh, given the fact that there were so many colonists coming, so many immigrants coming. But soon, William Penn ran out of the funds to pay. The, the Lenapes expected annual gifts. They expected that any lands that were not promptly settled would be paid for again. Uh, they had rules of engagement, if you will, that William Penn did, in fact, follow for a couple of years. And then he ran out of funds. When he returned to um, England in 1684, Uh, Nicholas, Moore, Nicholas Moore wrote to him and said that several of the sachems, the leaders in Bucks County, were unhappy because they had not been paid fully for the land. And they were also unhappy because they were being pushed out. When the Swedes, Finns, and Dutch were in, you know, without the uh, great numbers of English Quakers coming in, they lived next to each other. They visited each other's villages. They engaged with each other. They intermarried, that is, the Europeans and the Lenapes. But with William Penn's thousands of colonists, uh, the Lenapes were pushed out. And so it was a different situation uh, at this point in time. And Nanakasi, one of the Lenape leaders from Bucks County, said that William Penn is my brother no more because of the situation with settlement, because he was no longer paying the annual payments. And while they fixed the problem, that is, Penn's government fixed the problem in 1684-86, uh, it came up later. Okay, the way it was dealt with in the 1860s and after was that since Penn couldn't pay for the land in northern Bucks County, couldn't finish the deal, if you will, a deed had been drafted in 1686, the plans for settling uh, central and uh, northern Bucks County were put on hold. Uh, if, and you can see this with Thomas Holmes' map of 1687, whereas the plans were here for settling 
uh, I should say, this is the Delaware Valley, the De Delaware River. This is the west and north. Okay, so the north and west of Bucks County was not being settled at that point in time because the deal hadn't been done. But in the 1730s, after William Penn's death, uh, his sons and James Logan came up with the plan for the walking purchase. I think everybody, unfortunately, knows about the walking purchase, but to uh, recap a bit, uh, the old deed, so-called deed that was never signed, never finished, was brought out, and Logan claimed that the Lenapes had agreed to the sale, and they had received adequate payment, and that all that had to be done is a walk of a day and a half from Wrightstown to uh, North, and that uh, this would certainly uh, only be the fulfillment of uh, an agreement that had occurred earlier. The Lenapes refused, Lapawinsa, Tishkohan, and others refused. They said it's simply not true. So the Pennsylvania government went to the Iroquois and said, okay, you're in charge of the Lenapes. So you tell them they have to give up this land. The first time they did that, that is the Pennsylvania government, the Iroquois answered, no, uh, we're not the superiors of the Lenapes. They tried again. And this time, another group of Iroquois said, yes, we will inf inform them that they have to vacate the property. And so beyond that, in addition to that, um, Logan arranged for the path to be cleared, uh, hired three runners, and in the course of 18 hours, when there was supposed to be a leisurely walk, uh, one man finished 65 miles uh, to a point west of Machunk, so, or Jim Thorpe today. So all of, oops, all of this area was taken from the Lenapes, the last land they had on the Delaware. And Logan didn't just, you know, take this land. Uh, he, he drew the line diagonally. And so over the next decade or so, the Lenapes did leave. Not all, but most left the area. And in the 1750s, we have the Seven Years' War, which was in part uh, caused by the um, injustice uh, of the Pennsylvania government uh, with the walking purchase and other instances. So where does Benjamin Franklin fit here? And so very briefly, I'd just like to um, make a few points, a few observations. I'm not a Franklin scholar. I was born on his birthday, if that gives me any cred. <laughs> and probably became a historian because my mother thought that was terrific. I was born in Philadelphia. And, uh, but, you know, what, where does he stand uh, on the route that the Lenapes took um, through the 17th, but more importantly for his purposes in the 18th century? Emma Lapsansky has written very eloquently uh, about Franklin's views and actions on race and slavery, underscoring his ambivalence and evolution over time. So I have four observations, and I welcome people to tell me, you know, I'm off base, uh, if, if you think I am. I have done some reading, so, uh, but this may be food or fodder for discussion. But at, at, at age 31, in 1737, he seems to have been a silent witness, you know, a bystander to the walking purchase. I don't know of him raising any concerns. He certainly knew Logan and consulted with him on a number of occasions, but 
not about the Walking Purchase, as far as I know. In the 1740s and 50s, in raising militias, in writing about the violence on the Pennsylvania frontier, uh, Franklin expressed little or no understanding of the just grievances of the Lenapes regarding the walking purchase and other uh, ways in which they were cheated of land. On the other hand, after the Seven Years' War, war amid deepening racism uh, as a result of that war, primarily, in 1764, in a pamphlet, uh, Franklin condemned the Paxton Boys and wrote about the Conestogas who had been massacred in terms of their individual individuality, not their race. He also defended the Moravian Indians who had taken refuge in Philadelphia. And in his 1784 pamphlet, Remarks Concerning the Savages of North America, um, Franklin wrote respectfully, at least in part, about Native American customs. Emma points out in, at the end of her essay in the volume edited by Paige Talbot that, quote, the magnitude of the American struggle with race, class, and culture confounded Franklin. He had no workable plan, a situation which certainly resonates with us today. With his tremendous intellect, political savvy, and energy, we wish that he might have given equality and justice for all people much more uh, priority. Thank you very much. word about pronunciation. I can't help this. So you heard me say Lenny. Uh, my inclination was to have said Lenape, Lenape, just as Professor Soderlin did, but I didn't really know. So blame it on Google. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our second speaker this morning is Emma Jones Lapsansky, Emeritus Professor of History and Curator of the Quaker Collection at Haverford College, where she continues to teach and consult with students and with scholars who visit Haverford's Quaker collections. Some of her recent joint publications include Quaker Aesthetics, Back to Africa, Benjamin Coates and the American Colonization Movement, and contributed essay essays to Benjamin Franklin in Search of a Better World, and Pennsylvania, A History of the Commonwealth. She's currently at work on two projects, a history of the Bryn Mawr Quaker family and a study of a mid-20th century Philadelphia multicultural intentional community. Professor Lapsansky's talk is entitled Complexity and Nuance, Benjamin Franklin, William T. Coleman, and a Serpentine Narrative of Race in America. Professor Lapsansky. Thanks for having me here. It's nice having Ben there in the back listening to me. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, I'm here to add complexity to the, to the game. Um, a friend of mine asked me a couple of days ago if Native Americans were ever slaves. And I said, well, I wish there were a quick, neat answer to that question. Which Native Americans, which slaves, when, by whom, Fro from when to where? Uh, and in some sense, that's what I'm going to do today, is to sort of walk us through things that will make you squirm in your seat and say, why isn't she giving us answers? I've got 20 minutes to say something stimulating about what are the two largest topics in our nation's history. 
the multi-tentacled Benjamin Franklin, and the stormy, enig stormy enigma of American race relations. 20 minutes. Each topic separately has stimulated nearly thousands of volumes, indeed perhaps hundreds of thousands of volumes. And that's before you count websites and tweets and Facebook posts and memes and postage stamps and flags and coffee mugs and tweets and children's toys and Franklin's own voluminous writings. But I have 20 minutes in which to tackle both together. So I hope to leave you with a myriad of questions, some inspiration to pursue your own answers and a desire to pose some new questions. And I forgot my bottle of water. Can I have it so I don't, it's on the chair right there. Lovely. Thank you. <clears throat> I've spent many decades, a good deal of my childhood, plus a half century of my professional life, pondering the meaning and implications of community. What defines it? What promotes it? What encourages it? What extends it? What nourishes it? What stresses it? What fractures it? What destroys it? This may be why Franklin has been of interest to me, where he spent his life asking similar questions and experimenting with ways to define community, to encourage it, to extend it, and to think deeply about what is required of each citizen in order to celebrate, defend, and protect it. And that is where we are now. Also like Franklin, I've been a tinkerer, a person who likes to play not only with ideas, but to contemplate community, but likes to play with machines. I repair my own lamps with my sewing machine. I poke around under cars, or I used to before they had computers in them. And I design and, and build simple furniture. Like Franklin, I like to fiddle with things. Between 2005 and 2008, a traveling exhibition on Franklin, curated by Paige Talbot and supported by a number of the institutions which bring you this event today, highlighted Franklin's search for a better world and a number of the images I'm going to revisit with you today were included in that exhibition. I encourage you to take a walk through that exhibition, uh, which has an, an interesting book and a series of, art, of essays that go with it. Um, you can find it online. Everything's online now. It, you don't have to believe it all, but it's there. Uh, one of my favorite artifacts in, the, in this exhibition, oh, it works. Oh, it works. One of my favorite objects in, the, in this exhibition is the commode chair exhibited, exhibited here. Not only does this chair suggest Franklin's inventor, innovator, techno-wizard techno streak, but it also helps to highlight Franklin as the commensurate extrovert, determined to maximize every opportunity to engage with his fellow citizens. When he was in his 30s, he's reported to have told his mother that, he'd rather, when I'm, that when, I'd rather have it said he lived usefully than he died rich. And so I like to imagine Franklin in this chair, perhaps with a book on his lap. Here's the curator's description of that chair, which he designed and made when he was in his 60s. The walnut armchair has a serpentine crest rail terminating in scroll back ears. I spent some time at Winterthur and I've never quite gotten over it. So th they describe this thing as if it, it is a solid object, which it is. Um, the crest continues to, to plain tapered styles that become the chair's rear legs. The central vase-shaped splat is solid, terminating in a simple molded shoe. Its serpentine arms end in scrolled hand grips and join the sides of the seat frame by means of serpentine supports. The broad seat has a deep frame with a plain rounded upper edge. And the deep central scallop, here's the issue of this chair, the deep central scallop to the front and sides of the chair to conceal a chamber pot. The front legs are cabriole with plain knees and serpentine corners. The front legs terminate in shoe, trifle feet, and so on and so forth. This chair strikes me as an example of the limitless ingenuity which fueled a seamless spectrum of modernization. Not wanting to waste a moment of what might be community time, Franklin is said to have entertained and engaged in conversation while sitting on this chair. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea whether it's real. It's a story that's with us, and, and he did design this chair, and it's come down through his family. It's in the exhibition. The man liked company <laughs> anywhere and everywhere. He liked to think. He liked to have other people think with him. 
um, he was all about community. And, and I'm going to argue that, that that's part of what drove all his various things, including his ideas on race. He's the only American founder to sign the Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Paris, and the Constitution. A long life, Franklin was multifaceted, writer, printer, publisher, innovator, philosopher, entrepreneur, statesman, public intellectual, and sometimes slaveholder, and sometime anti-slavery advocate at the end of his life. This chair is what one example of the limitless ingenuity which, which fueled his le seemingly limited spectrum of modernization, the lightning rod, improvements to the wood-burning stove, bifocal glasses. He was among the first to provoke, promote the modern, day, modern work schedule, that is a day where when he'd finished the work for the day, if it was too early in the day, he'd keep his presses running so people would think that he was ambitious and, and busy. Um, and, you know, it's a, in some sense you could say that he's the, the, uh, one of the inventors of what we now call make work. Um, but it was important to him to be looking as if he's doing things to make things go well. Franklin's st style, in his spare time, he organized his friends into the club called the Junto to engage in activities which he described may be serviceable to mankind. He didn't say womankind. To their country and to their friends and to themselves. It's this group that formed the nucleus of a lending library, a firefighting brigade, a university, a learned society, a militia, a hospital for the poor, insurance company, and many other things. I want to suggest Oh, okay, I said that already. I want to suggest that this was a man ahead of his times. And surely part of Franklin's enduring appeal results from this commitment to democracy and community, publishing news announcements, advocating for a postal service and a widely distributed cartoon, urging the squabbling American colonies to join or die. Described by historians as the nation's first political cartoon, did it presage the Facebook meme. This image galvanized the then disparate American colonies to join Franklin in the 1754 Albany Conference, at which delegates from Maryland and the six colonies north of Maryland made an unsuccessful stab at creating an alliance, a useful community that would present a united response to Native American affairs. He was hoping to do something close to a United Nations. Maybe that's too much of a statement, but he hoped to somehow get people together to talk across boundaries. Yes, Franklin was doggedly ahead of his times, but the innovator publisher was also a man of his times, struggling to grasp how past notions of community should inform the community of the future. One vexing aspect of the community of the future was and remains the question of defining the role and rights of so-called others in the new society, women, immigrants, Native Americans, and especially African Americans and slaves. Such issues bedeviled Franklin and his f fellow constitution framers. And those issues of community did bedevil us today. Who's in, who's out? Who's in sort of? Who's in a little bit? Who should be out all the way? Um, and how do we define that at any given moment? In the early years of his life, Franklin, the voluminous writer, wrote little about African Americans or slavery, though the in-your-face presence of both was surely part of his childhood experience on the docks of Boston, where the black population mushroomed from a few hundred in the first decade of the 18th century to more than 2,000 by 1720. So Franklin was in a place where he could see Africans arriving day after day after day after day. He doesn't talk about it. Uh, a similar increase in black faces accompanied the maritime growth of Philadelphia. And in, even in his life abroad, Franklin did not escape the issue of Africans in servitude. As of 1729, he printed... Go. Okay. To put this toy where I will drop it. Okay. As of 1729, he printed Quaker Ralph Sandiford's abolitionist treatise. And in the 1730s, he printed another anti-slavery tract for his friend Benjamin Lay. And these treatises are filled with things that Franklin surely read. He was a voracious reader. He didn't just print them. He must have read them. And it says, 
Um, and though in the time of ignorance the Lord winks and the sincere and harsh of all societies are owed by him, yet it further manifests itself, who shall withstand him? Uh, this is, is Sandiford excoriating Americans for holding slaves. It's a long and deep and, and powerful uh, anti-slavery pamphlet. He printed it, but he didn't put his name at the bottom. It says printed for the owner, for, for the writer. It does, doesn't have his name on it. He did the same thing in 1737 for Benjamin Lay, who was a friend of his. But again, he didn't identify himself as the printer. It's hard to imagine that Franklin, the voracious reader in several languages, didn't read and contemplate the contents of these works. He was, after all, fluent in several languages and intellectually curious at nearly every level. By the time he was 17, he had already consumed and contemplated a number of the unconventional socio-political ideas of his day, including John Locke's on human understanding, Anthony Collins's concerning human liberty, um, and this is his, his copy signed. Um, and Thomas Tryon's health's grand preservative, which persuaded him to become a vegetarian, even though he reported being teased for being peculiar in this way. I, I add this because I find uh, this piece, which I have only skimmed, um, about why we should become a vegetarian, part of his, I, I'm going to argue, it's part of where he is at the end of his life, when he's still trying to figure out who's in, who's out, who can we eat, who can we push off the land. Um, and at, at some point, that's where he was. In many facets of his life and work, Franklin repeatedly bumped into conundrums of race. And like most men of his age and status, he lacked templates for dealing with them. He lacked templates for detangling them. But unlike many of his peers, the pragmatic Franklin actively wrestled with the vexing questions, often reaching ambiguous and even contradictory answers. One scholar has described Franklin as a man who brought slavery to the marketplace of ideas and left it there. But such a description sells short a man who, whom another scholar dubs the Franklin who has the most, the founder who has the most to teach us today, both about the art of living and about restoring civility to our public sphere. And we could certainly use some of that. Indeed, Franklin consistently kept his eye on what he believed were the loftiest goals of justice and integrity in public life, even as he mused about, as one scholar describes it, the fact that our humanly limited mixed motives intertwine our lofty goals with some of our basis instincts. And I think that's right. We start off with lofty goals. We have sort of narrow little reasons for doing them, and they get all tangled up together. Who should be included in community? And at what level of power, pondered Franklin, the philosopher-politician. Franklin did, after all, sign onto, onto a constitution that excluded non-landholding men and all women from a political voice. It would be decades before white non-landholding men would be allowed to vote. More decades before the 15th Amendment brought the franchise to African-American men. And yet more decades before passage of the Women's Suffrage Amendment. And yet more decades before all of the men who faced the military military draft, could cast a vote for the leader who would send them off to die. Indeed, race is, in some ways, a metaphor and a symbol for America's continuing struggle to grapple successfully with the size, scope, and definitions of community, the definition of others, and with the distinction between us and them. Um, it was really interesting to listen to Jean talk about what we call, call Native Americans, but they didn't call themselves Native Americans. They called themselves the Lenape and the this and the that. And, the, and they said, we don't know whether we like these people at all, but we might talk to them. Um, and who's us and who's them? Indeed, race is in some ways a metaphor and a symbol for Americans' continuing struggle to grapple successfully with the size, scope, and definitions of community, the definition of others, and with the distinction between us and them in a community which we have set on a foundation of liberty and justice for all. How many all? Unlike many of his peers, the pragmatic Franklin often actively confronted the vexing, vexing questions of otherness and race, often reaching ambiguous, even contradictory answers. In the 1780s, 
the closing decade of his life, Franklin served as president of an abolition organization, but his progress on the road to that role was bumpy and inconsistent. In the 1750s, he showed himself to be suspicious of many of the others, disparaging low women, Catholics, Jews, decrying alien German Im immigrants who would swarm into our settlements. Some of this rhetoric sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, German immigrants who would swarm into our settlements and labeling, na labeling Native Americans as drunken savages. No, 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 co cocaine. No, it's not cocaine. Sorry. Uh, as drunken savages who delight in war, take pride in murder, and should be pursued with large, strong, and fierce dogs. Yet in the 60s, when white Americans launched an unprovoked attack on Indian settlement, he labeled the attack white savagery. He's working on it. He doesn't get it right. He's working on it. We haven't got it right either. And Franklin retained this labile intellect till the end of his life. Being ignorant is not so much a shame as being unwilling to learn, he put into the mouth of poor Richard's almanac in 1755. At the beginning of that decade, he described African Americans as sullen, malicious, revengeful, and by nature thieves. Again, very modern language we hear. And he lamented planting the sons of Africa in America, where we would so when we have so fair an opportunity of excluding all blacks and tawnies and swarthies, among whom he meant Asians, Spaniards, Russians. And he said, we have the opportunity to increase the lovely white and red. These are the people he was mad at before should be chased by dogs. Um, but ever the inquiring scientist, he visited a school for black children. Maybe he did so only because his wife was related to an abolitionist who ran a school for black children. But in any case, he emerged from the visit with a, quote, higher opinion of the black race than I'd ever before entertained, and conceded that blacks' tendency to thievery might be attributed more to their situation than to their nature. Yet he later framed his concern for, quote, poor Negro slaves who are sick and lame. Okay, that sounds like empathy. Mostly from the perspective of the burden they placed on their masters. He ordered that his son not receive his inheritance unless he freed his slave. But this was partly out of the concern that slaves and, and servants made their owners lazy and, and unambitious. In 1760, while he was in England, he seemed to shrug off the fact that King, his son's slave, ran away. He was of little use and often in mischief, Franklin reported. So even though he knew where King was, in the home of a woman who was teaching him music and otherwise spoiling him, that's Franklin's word, he didn't bother to try to reclaim the slave. Toward his own slave, Peter, who was also with him in England, he turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to some of Peter's behaviors and reported that he was therefore able to rub on pretty comfortably with the guy. But for all this inconsistency, Franklin, unable to ignore the questions of race, human nature, and community, consistently showed himself to be thoughtful, open, malleable, teachable, and by the 1780s, he was perhaps in a different frame of mind. Franklin scholar Lorraine Pengel described Franklin as the founder who has the most to teach us today, both about the art of living and about restoring civility in our public sphere. Indeed, Franklin, the man ahead of his times, consistently kept his eye on what he believed were the loftiest goals of justice and integrity in public life. But Franklin was also a man of his times. In 1772, he made his first moral statement against slavery, excoriating Britain for participating in the slave trade and the misery, it, and this is his quote, the misery it produced among our fellow creatures. But beyond that, through the 1770s, he was largely silent on the subject of race. And his news sheet was heavily supported by both announcements and advertising, advertisements concerning slave sales and indentured services and notices of runaways from both. Um, it's a world where there isn't enough labor. We live in a world where we have too much labor and we're happy if only 3% of them can't find jobs. Imagine yourself in a place where the exact opposite is true. Labor is hard to come by, stuff is expensive. You want those people to stay in place. Black folks can, if they run away, you can see them. Oh, he must be a servant. White servitude, harder to identify them if they run away. But in any case, he did, his newspaper is filled 
with advertisements for slave sales, for the arrival of indentured servants. These are others. These are people that stay outside of the, commu of the main community and to hold a particular role in the main community. Um, he may or may not have been aware of the development of American slavery, that, it's, that in the early years, American African slavery was much like indentured servitude. People served for a while, then they were given a grub stake and a piece of land, and they went off to do other things. It's not until 1660 that Americans sort of morphed their way into a, a format of having African slavery be inheritable, perpetual, and based on race. Uh, but there's a whole range of semi-free people roaming around, and Franklin's trying to figure out where they should be. Ben Franklin, often described by historians as a master of legerdemain and a practical man who could bend his persona to meet the greatest advantage in, give, in a giving setting and wear many hats, a suave urbanite, he sometimes this button, there we go. He sometimes appeared in various ways, wearing a woodsman's coonskin cap in order to garden the romance that goes with the wilderness. In religion, he sometimes allowed himself to be assumed to be a Quaker, at other times an Episcopalian, though it's likely he was a deist, what we might today call an agnostic. But in the 1780s, his behaviors toward slavery began to change. Um, did his thinking change significantly too? We'll never know. I, uh, my sense of humor often takes over. And when I was working on this, this image, the image came to mind of the old Dolly Parton movie where the politician is going, ooh, I love to dance a little sidestep. Now they see me, now they don't. I've come and gone. Um, so in some sense, th <laughs> there is that piece. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you'll remember this scene. Or if you see the movie again, you'll now remember it really. Um, but by the 1780s, his behaviors towards slavery began to change. Did his thinking change significantly too? We'll never know. Nevertheless, in France in 1781, he gave sanctuary to a fugitive slave. Was his heart softened by this experience? <clears throat> or before this experience? And that's why he came to do it? There's no evidence that he ever again offered sanctuary to an escaped slave. When he returned from Europe in 1785, he allowed himself to be drawn into the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, where his friend Benjamin Rush was an active member. Was this a discussion working toward the Constitution and he just wanted to make some friends and build a community? Don't know. But in any case, Benjamin Rush was a part of this. He joins up. And in 1787, he becomes its president, endorsing its Constitution that proclaimed that God had made of one all the children of men. Was this his idea or was he signing on to something in order to build community? We don't know. And he, but he did accept the gift of Joshua of Josiah Wedgwood, which was the symbol of the abolitionist movement of its day. And it says, am I not a man and a brother? And making humanitarian anti-slavery statements about slavery's atrocious, he made statements about the, slave, the atrocious debasement of human nature. And he also said, quote, the unhappy man treated like a brute animal and the galling chains that impair the social affections of the heart. Don't know what he meant by that. When emerging from the Constitutional Convention, Franklin reportedly told the waiting crowd that the new government was a republic if you can keep it, implying that all citizens must be watchful, vigilant, and engaged in the maintenance of government. Again, we are here now. Indeed, the final weeks of his life, he petitioned Congress, quote, to devise means of removing this inconsistency of slavery from the character of the American people. Because, he said, equal liberty is the birthright of all men. He said nothing about women. And what of our times today? We too are imprisoned by our times. To paraphrase one pragmatic American leader, now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether our community or any community so conceived and so dedicated to equality and civility can long endure. The continuing tug of war over gay rights, over DACA, over equal pay, over equal health care, and of course over race, are our modern day struggles over community. But as we fast forward to our own day, let's pause en route to glance at a couple of reported 
of repeated crisis in community. Let's make a brief stop at 1875 when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act guaranteeing equal access to hotels, trains, and other public accommodations. And then let's stop at 1883 and 1896 when the Supreme Court vacated that act, not to be reinstated until the 1960s. Am I in my 20 minutes? I have five minutes left? <laughs> Let's make, a stop. Let's make a stop at 1919, when black soldiers returned from the war that made the world safe for democracy. My father was one of those returnees. There he is in the middle. He returned with a Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest honor our nation awards a military man. But he came home to a segregated society that could not pass a law against lynching. As W.E.B. Du Bois described these returning veterans, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. Make way for democracy. We saved it in France, and by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the United States of America, or know the reason why. Despite repeated campaigns from the 1920s onward, anti-lynching legislation has never passed, though it could be argued that the Hate Crimes Acts of 1994 to 2009 cover these issues. Let's make another stop at World War II. Another discussion is about the, the so-called segregated army. These, this is my father's army buddy. Okay. Let's make another stop at World War II, where Eleanor Roosevelt and the Tuskegee Airmen, Re Rose, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt getting into the, airport, into the plane with the Tuskegee Airmen to, to show her confidence in their ability to do their job. And from there, we can make a long and recent list. The take a knee, knee movement, the hashtag Me Too, the Black Lives Matter, who's in, who's out of the community. These are about community and othering, but they are also about many other issues. The issues are about the need to protect white supremacists, First Amendment right to free speech, and balance that against their right to hide behind freedom while they rape me, lynch my brothers, and terrorize civil protesters in Virginia. It's about the right to judge a man in the court of public opinion instead of the court of, of law. For me, the struggle over ERA is a clear example of the thin ice over which our protection of community skates. A few years ago, when I was lamenting the passage of the ERA, a smart black woman law professor responded in a way that made me think again. She said, I too am di deeply disappointed that we haven't, as a nation, been able to make this statement about justice. But part of me is content that it's so hard to change the Constitution because that means the people who want to change it in ways I don't like will have a hard time doing it too. Yeah, that's what I said, hmm. <laughs> Race has long been the easiest way to identify our continuing struggle with definitions of community. Who has which rights and powers within the community? But race is often a catch-all edifice that houses class and culture, religion and gender, urban and rural, age and education, disability and sexual orientation, white collar and blue collar, to name a few. My daughter is currently working for UNICEF on a campaign to eradicate corporal punishment for young people. As members of a human community, children should have protection for their right to be, their right not to be beaten. Slowly, ever so slowly, we may be awakening and progressing toward a full justice granted by, promised and pointed to by the Magna Carta in 1216, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the 1940s, and wherever we go from here. There's no denying that one pre pressing aspect of who should have what kinds of power in a community that gives lip service to liberty and justice and all for all is about race. But as Franklin tried to grasp, race is about more than black, white, powerless, powerful as two ends of a pole. Rather, race might be seen as a metaphorical image, much like Franklin's 1754 snake. It invites us across many areas to join or die. I'm put in mind here of a couple of people whose works and lives reached across racial barriers to live the racial join or die future. One such person was William T. Coleman, whose memory we honor here today. As part of this celebration, Coleman, a truly gifted intellectual, a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society, and ranked number one in the Harvard Law School class of 1946, was a member of the American Philosophical Society for, for promoting useful knowledge. 
founded by Franklin, and whose building we are sitting today. He was the first black person to serve as a clerk to, the, to a Supreme Court justice, a foot into the door of community. And in his role of Secretary of Transportation from 1975 to 77, was, the only, was only the second black cabinet officer. Coleman, who many supporters began to imagine sh should be in line to be a Supreme Court justice himself, was never one to sing his own praises. And he took the optimistic view of racial progress in America. He said, I don't think the first black this or that is relevant. He told the Washington Post in 1976, I'm just trying to make a reputation in this town that's not based on color. And we might take a lesson We might remember that race is, is a political term. It's not a biological term, it's a political term. It's probably somewhat an economic term in, as well. Um, one of my favorite memories, I had my mother doing research. If you ever need a research assistant, hire your mother because they're very, they're very intent on making you happy. Uh, she, she sat and read through 19th century censuses and uh, street directories, et cetera. And she, looked, she said, look at this. The same guy in this house in 1830 is described as black. In 1840, he's described as mulatto. The census taker had a different notion of him once he had more money. Um, so we might take a lesson from this. And we might take a lesson from Edward Ball, a white descendant of a sprawling South Carolina slaveholding family that dates its beginnings to the 1690s. Ball looked at the tangle of American race relations from yet another perspective and he published Slaves in the Family, a deeply researched study of the dozens of his European-American forebears who, came who became genetically intertwined with the black family who shared their world, their beds, their wombs, and in what historians, meant, someone historian has called the world they made together. Along that vein, for example, it's been interesting that mostly we've been content to identify our last president as our first black president, muting the fact that he's actually the first president who actually reflects the nation's complex and intertwined racial legacy. Revisiting Franklin's dogged commitment to community, his confusion and ambivalence about race, and his exhortation that Americans may have a republic if we can keep it, can help us to appreciate Southern historian Drew Faust, who in reviewing Ball's book, noted that by, quote, persuading Africans to join with him in a ceremony of commemoration and forgiveness, Ball closes his narrative with a powerful affirmation of his belief that the history of slavery is a nationally shared legacy. Blacks and whites, Africans and Americans are forever linked by the burdens of our past. Together we must challenge history's destructive silences. Like Franklin and his contemporaries, we continue to struggle toward a republic if we can keep it. And though modern Americans are often suspicious of heroes, often wanting them to be without flaws, Franklin can remind us that though heroes can be inconsistent and imperfect, they can inspire us to reach for our own better selves, even if, in Robert Browning's words, our reach exceeds our grasp. Always in search of a better world, Franklin was enigmatic, but he was a man of inquiring internet, intellect, broad vision, and a dogged commitment to justice, democracy, and community, as best he could probe and understand these elusive principles. And so are we. Indeed, Franklin's life and his struggles have much to inform modern America's pursuit of these same elusive principles. Like Franklin, might we position ourselves to learn new things, to continually re-examine the prism of race relations, and expand our wisdom on the subject of race? No matter what we as individuals think we know and understand about race matters as a community and as individuals, there are always new questions. Did Indians have slaves? Were Indians slaves? The answer to all of those things is yes. No matter what we as individuals think we know and understand about race matters, we as a community and as individuals, like Franklin, need to remain teachable, changeable, open to wider understanding and healing of the tangled le legacy of race in America. Each of us needs to be all, to, to, to be asking ourselves, what do I need to learn? What do I need to do in order to do my part in moving inclusive community forward. Thank you for listening for more than 20 minutes.
Now it's my turn to speak to today's theme. I'm a sociologist, demographer, and social statistician. Before undertaking my current appointment at the APS, I was for 41 years a research professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, more recently, six years executive director of the Division of Behavioral Social Sciences and Education at the National Academy of Sciences. As you can see, the subject of my talk this morning is what's wrong with American schools. But first, I want to say a word about Benjamin Franklin and race awareness. Um, most of my brief and unsatisfactory text was wonderfully uh, uh, anticipated and undercut by Professor Lapsansky, but I'm still going to say a few things. Uh, and she did it much better than I ever could have. Uh, but let me just say this. In honoring Benjamin Franklin, we should not gloss over those aspects of his life and writings that we would not applaud today. Franklin was a complicated man, and he lived in complicated times. Throughout the revolutionary era, race, and more particularly the heinous uh, practice of slavery, was a central public issue. Uh, Walter Isaacson has written that the origin of the surname Franklin was an English term for free man. Yet as surely as Benjamin Franklin was a free man, at least after the escape from his apprenticeship in Boston, Franklin was less willing for most of his life to grant that status to others. He was acutely aware of race and pejoratively with reference to more than the differences among Europeans, blacks, and Native Americans. And, and I have kind of strong personal feelings about this because m m when my parents were born in Chicago a bit more than a century ago, they were not white as I am. They were Jews. And Jews were not then white. My take from all of this is that racial prejudices, like other elements of culture, can be altered. Sometimes from within the individual, as occurred to some degree, I think, certainly within Franklin. Sometimes on account of interpersonal influence, sometimes by dint of mandated behavioral and structural change. The decision in Brown versus Board of Education, which was implemented in part by William T. Coleman, was a sterling example of the latter. My talk has direct relevance to today's theme of race awareness, for my findings point strongly to the enduring presence of race-ethnic disparities in our nation's elementary and secondary schools, but also to a promising way forward, I hope. So which way do we go here? Let's try that. Yes. So my agenda is, is first to briefly uh, talk about what educational outcomes matter, uh, how the U.S. fares in international comparisons of achievement test scores, why the U.S. fares poorly, and whether there's a way forward. So folks like me um, really care about three kind of proximate educational outcomes. One is these academic achievement test scores that everybody writes about. The other, which is really much more important in terms of the labor market, are edu is educational attainment, credentials, years of schooling. And then there are grades, teachers' evaluations of performance. Um, a colleague of mine and, and I wrote a, a nice paper on longevity in which we found that in a, a cohort of people who had been followed from high school graduation to beyond age 70, the, the largest, highest correlate of longevity, of survival to that age, was high school rank in class. Why would that be? This we owe credit, for this we owe credit to Woody Allen. It's, you know, what do you, how do you get good grades in high school? You show up on time. You do the right thing at the right time in the right place over a period of time. That kind of stays with you. You look both ways when you cross the street and so forth. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about achievement test scores. The American population has, been, has seen bashing of, the edu of its edu uh, primary and secondary educational system for something like 35 years now, beginning with the publication of a commissioned report, A Nation at Risk. And you can read what it says there. And 
the report was dead wrong. What was really going on was an instance of what's called Simpson's Paradox. The re this report relied on declining test scores, especially on the, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT. But what was happening was that every major social group in the country was actually performing steadily better. The thing that was, was happening that was driving the lower test scores is that more of the lower scoring groups were taking the tests. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, this was just wrong from the outset. And here we are today with our uh, Secretary of Education. This is from the Washington Post uh, headline a little bit more than a year ago uh, when our uh, Education Secretary, uh, Betsy DeVos, says outcomes at U.S. schools are so bad they probably can't get worse. So let's take a look at some of the data. I'm going to look at three different sets of achievement test score data. PISA, which is the Program for International Student Achievement, which tests reading, math, and science at age 15. TIMS, which tests, uh, in a smaller set of countries, science and math at eight, in grades 4 and 8. And then I'll, last, I'll turn to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, what we call, uh, what styles itself the nation's report card which tests any number of things, but I'm going to focus on reading science and math in grades 4 and 8. By the time these kids get to grade 12, they know that those tests don't count. And the test performance shows it. Um, so here's PISA in the most recent uh, uh, period, 2015. Of 70 nations, the U.S. ranks 24th in reading, 25th in science, 40th in math. So it isn't really the case that we couldn't possibly be worse. I mean, just on its face, you don't have to go any further than that to see that. But we're not at the top of the heap, right? And the same is true of TIMS. There is a smaller set of countries. We rank 10th, 11th, 14th, 10th, depending on which grade level, which subject. Um, so we're not at the top of the heap. Why is that? Let's look at the main, what I did, the serious part of the kind of real work behind this talk, was just treating each of the main race ethnic groups in the United States as if each one were a separate nation. Uh, that's a, politically and socially, that's a sad, sad way to think about it, but let's, let's look at the data that way. Here's what happens. In reading, whites are sixth and Asians, and Asians fourth. In science, whites are fifth and Asians ninth. In math, whites are 20th and Asians 21st, not, not, not quite at the top. And then you see that Hispanics and blacks are further down. Now, they're not at the bottom, nowhere near the bottom. But it's the fact, the fact is that the U.S. doesn't reach the top internationally is because what, of what everybody sees as soon as we get the latest results from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is that there is an achievement gap. So the U.S. standing is basically a function of the achievement gap. And the same thing here holds for the Tim studies. You can see in fourth grade science, Asian American, Asian Americans are first, and whites are fourth, and, and so on like that. And you see that blacks and Hispanics are, are further down the list, uh, but not, not at the bottom. So what about the actual trends? Well, these are the reading trends by race and ethnicity. You can see that whites and and Asians are at the, consistently at the top. There's a gap in 2006, I'm sorry to say. Um, and, but uh, Hispanics and, uh, and blacks are at least holding steady and perhaps improving. Um, science, we, again, uh, things are looking a bit better, certainly better than they were uh, 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 a dozen years ago. Um, but of course, there are these differentials. And in math, um, again, the lower scoring groups are doing somewhat better, or pretty much holding their own, um, but they're lower than uh, non-Hispanic whites and, and, and uh, Asian Americans. What's going to happen in future? This is going to continue when you just look at these test scores in the aggregate. And basically the reason is because this, notice that my, 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 you know, 
demographers say that uh, that prediction is really difficult, especially when it comes to the future. And uh, and and you notice that that this I've gone out to 2030 here, but of course the kids who are going to be 15 and 2030 are still are very much with us already. So this is this is a pretty accurate uh, uh, scheme and. And what you see is that the uh, numbers of relative numbers of non-Hispanic whites are going to decline, and the number of Hispanics are going to increase, and everybody else is going to be pretty much the same. So there's there's a kind of a demographic force to maintaining this sort of disparity in the aggregate performance of the U.S. that has nothing to do with what's really going on. So what accounts for the race ethnic differentials? Uh, for that, until Yesterday morning, I, w I had to go back another, another uh, 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 round of the PISA data because they, the st right stuff wasn't there. So I looked at PISA in 2012, and I controlled socioeconomic status of the families and whether they were born in the U.S., family structure, grade level, and grade repetition. Those kinds of variables explain less than 30 percent, and in most cases, actually, only about 20 percent in most subjects of the differences between whites and, uh, and blacks. And with, but with regard to Hispanic white differences, it's really quite different. Reading those simple variables accounted for 70% of the difference in performance uh, and 40% in science and half in math. So a lot of that in the case of Hispanics is just family background. Um, so what's wrong with American schools? This is the answer to the question in my title. The U.S. is mediocre in international achievement comparisons, mainly because Hispanics and blacks score poorly, partly because they are socioeconomically disadvantaged, and also because Hispanics uh, are increasing as a share of the youth population. That's why. What can you do about it? There are endless claims about improving academic achievement among minorities. And some of those claims are true. Some of them are highly questionable. There's endless debate about these matters. The problem is that few of the successes are at scale. And by being at scale, I mean dealing with a relatively large population, sustained across time, and at every age or grade level. So the question I asked myself was, is there such a case? And the answer is yes. Think about the following scenario, and I'm going to read this. If someone asked you to describe an expected achievement, expected achievement scores in a student population where many have high personal debt, where there's only a single parent at home, where 40% of the population is Latino or black, and students can expect to change schools between six and nine times when they move between, through primary and secondary school, what would you expect to see? Lousy performance, right? And all of those things would contribute to great difficulty academically. But in the case I'm going to show, talk about, that just isn't so. The case I'm talking about is, 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 is a set of schools around the world, but primarily in the United States, that are, that are, create, are created and run by our Department of Defense. There is something called the Department of Defense Education Authority. And the performance of those kids in those, kids in those schools is, is actually reported regularly in the reports of the National Assessment of Educational Progress. So what do you see? In reading achievement, I'm comparing, uh, I have fourth and eighth grade, the higher two, two lines are eighth graders, the bottom two lines are fourth graders, uh, and the kids in the DODEA schools outperform those in the rest of the nation, consistently across time at those grade levels. The same is true, not quite to the same degree, uh, in reading at, in, in math at grade four, but it certainly is true at grade eight. The kids in the DODEA schools uh, outperform those. And by the way, the, the, I was worried about the composition of the populations in the DODEA schools. It's very interesting that there are no rank distinctions. Kids of enlisted, peop enlisted parents, and, and uh, what do you call them, uh, parents, are mixed, all mixed together in those schools. So this is a kind of a complicated story, but basically what it says, if you look at the bottom lines, um, the, these are test, actual test score differences 
the standard deviation uh, measure of dispersion of test scores on these tests is about 35. And the bottom line is that the DODEA schools eliminate uh, about a third to, to more than half of the, diff of the race ethnic differentials that occur in the country in general. That's huge. I've been in business of research and evaluation for, for 50 or more years. And, you know, if you can move something a tenth of a standard deviation, there are parades. Uh, and this is absolutely huge. So the question then is, how do they do it? And here are some of the characteristics. You can read them for yourselves. And basically, you're, you're in a closed system in the DODEA schools. You've got command and control. Families are basically required to participate in, in the actively in the education of their children. And surprisingly, the teachers are unionized and there is very high, a very high degree of collaboration between management and the teachers uh, in how they do things. These kids do not have to take the tests that were mandated under No Child Left Behind. There are tests in these schools but they are used primarily for diagnosis, not, uh, not to punish people. So these, these are all good things. The question is exactly what is it that does it? And the best answer we can come up with so far is you need the whole package. So in short, you have a wraparound package uh, in spite of family disruptions, in spite of frequent moves, in spite of bullying, which apparently is a problem at these schools and also inadequate services for dis disabled students. And I won't go into the selection issue. I, I, don't, I don't think there are really any good data on it, but everything I've learned suggests that selection of kids into those schools is not a big issue. So they're a model at scale of what all school systems should be working to accomplish. It would be nice to find out exactly what works, but there's more here. I just came across a report within the last few days on, on, on an institution called Community Schools. And there is a, an evaluation, I'll actually turn to that, here's the, here's the picture, uh, picture of, the, uh, of this, this uh, report which looked at something close to 150 different studies to see what really works. And they came up with essentially the same characteristics that the DODEA schools have. Integrated student supports, that means the whole package. It means health and well-being, mental and physical, not just class time. It means expanded learning time and opportunities, family and community engagement, and collaborative leadership and practice. Those are the things, if you have the whole package, uh, education works. There are a lot of examples of that around the country now, and I'm going to close by mentioning the fact that there is such an initiative now underway in Philadelphia. It's being evaluated by a local firm uh, called, a uh, nonprofit called Research for Action. Uh, and that was called out, uh, that project was in fact called out as one of the ex exemplars uh, in the report that I just mentioned. So I'm hopeful about community schools as, as one model of educational change that really will work at scale uh, and which I'm glad to say is present here in Philadelphia. So, thank you. We, we don't have as much time here as I thought we would, but we did promise a Q&A. So I've asked Jeremy to, to, to put a few, some chairs up here and, uh, and professor, dear professors, if you would join me up here, uh, we could have a Q&A a, a &A for a little bit until when? What? Eleven, more or less? Yes. Uh, thank you. Oh, sure. Of course. A grandchild that has to get from here to adulthood. <laughs> So the floor is, is now open. <laughs> yes, sir. 
Why don't you identify yourselves when you're you holding it? That's fine. I, I think there's, well, I'm interested in what anyone has to say, but I'm kind of interested in what Dr. Lipansky has to say. Uh, Martin Luther King, of course, uh, initially tried to move on before he was assassinated into a broader approach out of black-white relations and expanding it into uh, general societal problems. I forget what he called it. And this was to some extent picked up by Jesse Jackson, who was a in my opinion, a very brilliant man, where he tried to form his rainbow coalition and whatever. But I do not sense, and Dr. Bell's at this point reaches you, both, unfortunately, nonetheless, quickly. I, I do not sense myself that this idea that there will be a coalition, whether for political, social, or whatever, among the uh, broad, what we would call the non-white community, uh, I, 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 I sense that there is a different divide that, and I even feel to some extent the only real heavy duty barrier in, in the United States today is between blacks and non-blacks. Uh, what are your thoughts? Am I misled? What do you think? I'm not sure I understand your question fully, so I'm going to repeat it in case I got it wrong. Well, but are you say, they're saying that, that essentially the major divide in American, the major fault line in American society is race? And just race in general, black versus non-black. I do not sense there is the same antipathy and the same sense of, of we're all in this together. So I guess, I guess I really don't understand your question. I think that we're a nation that's fractured along an enormous number of lines and that at any given moment, every one of us as an individual is part of the fracturing. Uh, it's part of the problem as well as the solution. Um, I, that's why I use the image of join or die. You know, there's 13 different colonies and all, seven of them didn't, didn't even come to the Albany Conference. You know, so I think there are some, some portions of where the fractures are that aren't even at the table yet. Um, I think that race is the one we can see most clearly. It's the same issue as, as when servants run away. You can see the black one, the, the white one can say, oh, this is my cousin over here. I'm, I'm just staying with my cousin on the farm. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's easier to see, but I'm not sure that having it be easier to see is an indication that it's more real. I, I'm not sure that I'm answering the question correctly. Um, I, I don't. I, I think of uh, how much of our society is still, you know, and it's on both sides of the racial line, how much of our society is still homophobic. Um, you know, is, is that, I, mean, I think that, that when we get done with the othering question, we'll be done with it finally. You know, we, you and I will be dead and our, our grandchildren will be dead. But, but it strikes me that the, that the mental activity of othering has so many other pieces in it that black and white is what we can see most easily, but that it, it covers a whole variety of other kinds of othering that we talk about less well, partly because we have not very good language for talking about it, any of it well. Um, so I guess this sounds crazy. I guess I'm glad we have the race thing because it gives us language to talk about all the other fractures. <laughs> 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 um, and, and we haven't figured out community yet. And, you know, I, I'm not sure that answers your question, but I'm, yeah. Let's see what other questions we have here. Um, I have noticed that with a lot of places who've had uh, industry, 
move out uh, and the rise of alcoholism, maybe to break up of families, that you end up in a few, a few babies being born or oh, generations down the line, you end up with educational disparities. You end up with parenting problems. Uh, I was wondering, aside from the, the political language, you'd have to state it in a different form of fashion. In those places, both black, white, or wherever they may be, should there be some kind of plan instituted in order to basically have schools, along with the statement of your four pillars, along uh, to have schools compensate for, I'm sorry to say it, bad parenting, Mm -hmm. uh, in order to counteract something that we know that happens because of economic situations and family stress and a basic breakup of the nucleus of the society, which is the family. I, I think that the, an the, an the answer to the, to, the question, to the question is yes, <laughs> uh, in my opinion. And, and what you really need, I mean, in, in society at large, we don't really have command and control the way you have in, in these military uh, installations. But I think you really need very, very strong incentives to bring parents into the schooling process to help them help their kids learn uh, and to understand how important it is that they engage in teaching their children and not merely feeding them. So I, I think that's a part of the wraparound package, is that you have to bring parents into the mix in a much more, in, in a much more effective way. And you're, you know, you're absolutely right about the, 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 uh, the pandemic of alcoholism and, um, and op opioid abuse that are really contributing to the problems we face right now. As I, I expect most of you know, um, death rates are increasing in the United States. It's the only place in the world where death rates are increasing. Uh, and it's across the entire age span now. Yeah. Yeah. No, ab no absolutely. Absolutely. Wait. So, you know, my, my take is we really need kind of ma massive, well-designed, well-evaluated, uh, social change in this country. Can I ask a question about the school thing? And I, I won't take up everybody's time, but um, where in, in the paradigm does reward come in? That is to say, why do school if you can't see anything beyond it? Can't see anything, a job out there? Of, you know, to, is, is that part of the mix here? No, absolutely. Um, I've spent most of my life uh, studying a cohort of some 10,000 kids almost all of whom were white, who graduated from Wisconsin high schools in 1957. So you, these people were born in 1939, so you can figure out how old they are now. And we still have like 80% participation among the survivors in this study. And this really started as a study of educational and occupational aspirations. And if you don't have the incentives out there, I mean, these kids, there's a famous sociological treatise uh, called Children of the Great Depression, written by a really good guy named Glenn Elder. And if I ever wrote a book about this group, it would be called Children of the Great Aff Affluence, because they grew up in the 50s. Everything looked rosy ahead of them. And we have to be able to ensure that there are rosy futures available for our kids, or the rest of the stuff, as you said, it really doesn't matter. We have to, we have to encourage high aspirations as well as as high achievement and to have re things that will support them. And we face yet another threat. I'm, I'm starting to read about um, um, AI, artificial intelligence, and what that is doing to the future of work. And if we're not careful and, and not successful in educating our youth, we're going to have people who, who can't get jobs because there will be no jobs out there for them, whereas if we do it right, we will have people who know how to control the machines that do the dirty work. We have a couple more questions back here. Sure. Uh, this is actually an historical question. 
Uh, the first speaker suggested that the Lenapes did not practice slavery, and the second speaker suggested that some Native Americans did. And I was just hoping that perhaps the two of you could coordinate your answers in regard to that. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that anyone is wrong, uh, but, uh, but how those two things fit together is interesting. The Lenapes, as a group, did not practice slavery. I know of one Lenape man who did own enslaved people, enslaved Africans in New Jersey. Uh, he was frowned upon by his, his community members. In fact, they kind of pulled support out from under him. Um, but other folks have said, well, I've heard of, of Indians enslaving whites. And the period I'm talking about is the 17th century into the 18th century. Certainly with the Seven Years' War, uh, whites were taken captive, but that wasn't the same as slavery. I mean, it was an act of war. There were certainly other uh, Indian nations who did practice slavery. It was practiced to a, an extensive degree although in a different way by Southeastern Indians. And over time, they were influenced by the uh, plantation system of the English and other uh, Europeans. And so that changed over the process of the 15th to the 18th century. So there were, as, as Emma certainly said, differences among Native Americans, but the Lenapes were definitely people who prized their own freedom and respected others' right to their freedom. And as I said in my argument, I think they had an influence on the ideals of Delaware Valley society, certainly not the way uh, uh, society practiced. I mean, we certainly had an important uh, contingent of slave owners in the Delaware Valley among Quakers as well as other uh, groups. But I, I do think it's true that it was freedom was a, a, uh, an ideal uh, and remains an ideal in the Delaware Valley even if it's not practiced as it should be. That's roughly the answer I would give, too, which is to say it's complicated. <laughs> but I do want to add one little caveat to that, and that is that we, in, in our current state of good and bad and this and that, you know, the hard lines about things, forget about the middle, which is that slavery is a, is a, is a malleable term. Slavery that is inheritable, perpetual, and based on race is the image we keep in our minds. But, but slavery that is the spoils of war and you take someone and make them work for a while and then, then somebody wins the war again and they get taken back home again. Um, there's there's a, 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 a malleability about slavery that's hard for us to grasp because we want things to be on one side of a great divide. Um, so, but I would agree with Jean. That's that's the description I would have given too. More in the southwest, um, in the southeast, um, but in the southeast, many of the of the Native Americans who had slaves then married them and had then the kids and then the kids became chiefs and yeah. You know, so it's not it's not as if you can say this was good and that was bad. One more question. Yeah, quick question. So, so um, in 1954, there was a meeting at UNESCO, the United Nations Educational Scientific Organization, to in response largely to what happened in Nazi Germany, where you know the issue was one of race purity, which met its heinous illogical end. And and the, the conclusion of that meeting, which consisted of psychologists and sociologists and anthropologists, was that the term race was being misused, that there was only one race, the human race, homo sapiens, of which we are all a part, and that although people may have different ethnic backgrounds or religious backgrounds or countries of origins, we are one race. That was 50 years ago. It still seems we misuse the word. Why is that? Why did we learn that lesson from that UNESCO meeting? Well, I said the little piece in my talk, which I will say quickly again and then shut up, um, which is that I think if we think of race as a political and or economic term, 
then it works. If we think of it as a biological term, it makes no sense. I'll give you an example, which is, you know that you all are familiar with the term Hispanic, and I use that to refer to uh, uh, non-Hispanic whites in the course of my talk. Do you know where that term came from? It's a, it's, a, it's a statistical definition. And in fact, the official definition is, quote, Hispanics may be of any race. That came out of a discussion of three or four people in the Bureau of the Census who were sitting around and realized that the former distinction they used, uh, which was called Spanish surname, really wouldn't work anymore. And so they tossed around a bunch of different terms and finally decided, well, how about Hispanic? And that has become politicized. In fact, the reason that Hispanics can be of any race is because the Hispanic community, which is really very heterogeneous, if you think about it, um, uh, kind of got its act together in order to try to make their account as large as possible. And the black community was very unhappy about that, but not as effective in effect in, in determining how we count people in this country. There you have it. So I want to quote, in closing this part, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to take matters too lightly, but I thought I might quote the great philosopher Pogo, uh, who said, we have met the enemy and he is us. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. <laughs>